Mabuhay. Welcome everyone. I'm Narisa Paglanowin, Program Manager of the Asian Arts and Culture Center at Towson University. First, I would like to let everyone know that this program is being recorded. Also, if you require captioning, you can view the transcript in a separate window by going to the streamtext.net link we will put in the chat. Thank you all for joining us this evening for our panel discussion, Filipino American Diaspora, Self-Representations Emerging from the Shadows. This program is a part of AANCC Spring 2021 season, Elevation, honoring AAPI experiences. Tonight's panel was brought about by our current virtual exhibition, Anak, My Child, by artist Lech Verkater and Borja. Lech Borja weaves history with personal experience to better understand her memories of displacement and their effect on shaping her as a person. You can view the exhibit online at towson.edu slash anak. You will learn more about Lex's work as she is, of course, one of our distinguished panelists tonight. Additional programs this season include the exhibition Fan Hong, A Bag of Rocks for a Bag of Rice, which can be viewed online. Towson University students, faculty, and staff can view the exhibit in person at the Asian Arts Gallery through May 15. Contact asianarts at towson.edu to make an appointment. Coming up April 10 through May 15 is our annual Asian North Exhibition and Festival. Asian North 2021 will include art installations in select locations throughout Baltimore Station North and virtual workshops, performances, and a Charm City Night Market online. We'll post the full schedule on our website and social media soon. We also have a limited number of Korean kite making kits that integrate art, social studies, and engineering. You can order them online through the link in the chat. Before introducing our moderator and panelists, I would like to note that the Asian Arts and Culture Center is a self-support department of Towson University. That means we have to raise all of the money needed for our operations and programs for memberships, grants, sponsorships, and individual donations. I would now like to thank the generous donors who have made this season of programs possible. E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, Maryland State Arts Council, William G. Baker Jr. Memorial Fund, Central Baltimore Partnership, AANCC members, TU College of Fine Arts and Communication, Yoshinobu and Kathleen Shiota, citizens of Baltimore County, Roe and Mary's P. Johnson Legacy Charitable Fund, the Harold J. Kaplan Foundation, TU COFAC Diversity and Inclusion Committee, TU Marketing and Communications, TU BTU Presidential Priority, Robert Mintz and Beth Arman, Anthony and Bonnie Montcalmo, Alexander Nagel, Connie Rosemount and John Greenberg, and TU Center for Student Diversity. Thanks to all of you who invest in inclusivity and dialogue across cultures and communities by supporting the Asian Arts and Culture Center. We are pleased to offer you tonight's program for free, and we hope that you will make a donation to show your support of our work so that we can continue to offer these types of programs. You can access our donation from the link in the chat. At the end of tonight's program, we'll post a link to our online evaluation form, as your feedback is essential to helping us create better programs and to keeping our program programs funded. As many of you know, AA and CC has a 50 year history of increasing the visibility of Asian and AAPI stories and creativity. Our exhibitions and programs promote cultural equity by moving Asia from the margins and viewing the world through the lenses of Asian and AAPI experiences. We are honored to present this panel of Filipino American writers, poets and artists whose work brings Filipino American diasporic, diasporic experiences to the forefront. Our distinguished panel includes multidisciplinary artist Lech Verkater and Borja, the inspiration for tonight's panel, poet, poet Luisa A. Igloria, professor of English and creative writing at Old Dominion University and the current poet laureate of Virginia, author E.J.R. David, associate professor of psychology at the University of Alaska Anchorage, and writer Dwight Ong, author of Voices of the New Generation Philam Community. Our panelists want to encourage all of you to post your questions in the chat throughout the discussion, and they will address your questions during the Q&A session at the end of the program. I would now like to introduce our moderator and my dearest friend, 
Dr. Marlo Delara, who will lead the discussion. Born in Baltimore, Maryland, USA, artist Marlo Delara received a PhD in the School of Fine Art, History of Art and Cultural Studies at the University of Leeds, and an MA in Psychosocial Studies at the Center of Psychoanalytic Studies at Essex. Her practice works within the realms of sound performance, visual distraction, and film. As the child of Filipino migrants of the brain drain coming of age, Delara's unabashed feminist socio-political practice research editorializes on contemporary global conditions. Her research relates to feminism, representation of marginalized populations, particularly within sound and music, and creative work as political action. Welcome, Dr. Delara. Thanks, Marisa. I've never been referred to you by a doctor. <laughs> Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for taking time to join us tonight, um, which will surely be uh, an enjoyable and entertaining evening where we get to hear from several different areas and disciplines about this moment of Filipino American um, expression. And that's really how I would like us all to kind of see this space. I'd like to invite you to partake in, and enjoy these readings and take them in as expressions of this, of, of a, Filipino American moment. Um, I thought it would be best to kind of just provide a short, um, a short uh, introduction or maybe framework for those of you who might be less familiar with Filipino American history or rather Filipino history. So um, I'll just read a bit from my dissertation actually. Um, here we go. Whether here in the United States or in the Philippines, we are, whether we like it or not, still entangled, caught, implicated in this ongoing process for liberation. In a passionate plea to members of the Filipino American diaspora to see the value of, per of preserving and evolving the native language of Tagalog or Filipino, postcolonial cultural critic and Filipino studies scholar E. San Juan Jr. asks, how can we tell our stories in our own words? How do we retrieve the lost voices of our people, valorize their lived experiences, and in the process transform the way Filipinos as a group are treated in the metropolis? Filipino America has evolved through specific and complicated post-imperial and racialized processes exacerbated by the pseudo-independent relations of the Philippines with its former colonizers, the United States of America. The Filipino American is living within a contemporary US national climate anxious about migration borders and foreigners while managing to frequent tethered associations of feelings of belonging and socio-historical orientation to the island. Regarding the size, in 2010, the US, cens US Census reported that there are approximately 4 million Filipino Americans, making them the second largest Asian population in the US. Examining the complicated specificity of the Philippine experience in a global space, which is marked by both repeated colonizations by Spain, US, and Japan, in which our histories were often deleted, obscured, and ignored, Filipino Americans have a troubling and yet unique history within the United States of America. And what I would like to see as models of perseverance and resilience as well. And so while the multiple waves of migration and the specificities of these histories, Philippine histories, Philippine American diasporic histories are not necessarily being addressed here in our discussion today, um, I encourage you to see the link below for the Filipino American National Historical Society, and also to keep your eyes out for uh, Filipino American History Month in October, where we, where it's all over social media and very hard to um, to not to ignore, which is a wonderful um, a wonderful development for our um, for our work. Um, this is not to say we won't touch upon these specific topics in our discussion today, our histories and how they're invisibilized, um, but we will not be really doing a timeline or history lesson because I'd really like this to be seen as a, as, as a conversation, as a way for us just to talk about how Filipino Americans are seeing themselves and, and how we all are part of the conversation as part of society. Um, so with that, um, Feel free, again, 
As Narisa mentioned, the chat box is a wonderful way to, if you have any thoughts or questions you'd want to, to be addressed later, or, or just to, as, as they would say in England, if you'd like to put a pin in it, you know, go ahead and um, put that in the chat box. And we'll be more than happy to address that in, um, in the Q&A section. So how we'll proceed now is we'll have the offerings and from our um, invited participants. Um, as starting um, with Lu, uh, the poet Luisa Igloria. And also, as you can see below in the chat box, we did put um, a fuller um, bio if you'd like to go into their um, more specific uh, background. So Luisa, welcome. And um, if you would like, uh, so welcome to the entire panelists. I should welcome you all. I'm so glad you're all here. Um, and if you would like to launch us today, Louisa, the floor is for you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having all of us. Good evening. Magandang gabi na imbag na rabii yung amin, Apu. I would like to start by reading three works, three short poems from various collections. The first one I, I will read is from my very first published poetry collection, called Cartography. And these are all poems on Baguio, which I consider my hometown. I grew up in Baguio and uh, I still write about it a lot in my work. I write about place, but I'm always writing about Baguio. So this is a poem called The Secret Language. It's a persona poem. And I guess I try to capture that sense of collision between worlds between America and the US before even any fact of travel outside of the Philippines, which certainly applies to my experience. The secret language. I have learned your speech, fair stranger. For you, I have oiled my hair and coiled it tight into a braid as thick and beautiful as the serpent in your story of Eden. For you, I have covered my breasts and hidden among the folds of my surrendered inheritance, the beads I have worn since girlhood. It is 50 years now since the day my father took me to the school in Bois, a headman's terrified peace gift. In the doorway, the teacher stood, her hair the bleached color of corn, watching with bird eyes. Now, I am Christina. I am told I can make lace fine enough to lay upon the altar of a cathedral in Europe. But this is a place that I will never see. I cook for tourists at an inn. They praise my lemon pie and my English, which they say is faultless. I smile and look past the window, imagining fathers and grandfathers cattle grazing by the smoke trees. But it is evening and these are ghosts. In the night, when I am alone at last, I lie uncorseted upon the iron bed, composing my lost beads over my chest, dreaming back each flecked and opalescent collar, crooning the names along with mine. Binaay, binaay. And the second poem I'm reading is a poem from my latest collection, Maps for Migrants and Ghosts. And I've decided to read this uh, because of the theme of diaspora, uh, which is, you know, considering returns or the impossibility of returns or what all that might mean to us. So uh, for a while, I did not uh, manage to make a return myself. And so this is a poem that kind of makes a record of uh, the most recent um, visit. Prodigal. Risk is but the fact you have to go too far. And if that's so, is it still risk after you've returned? Peering through rain slashed windows of the bus that twisted ponderous lozenge through a narrow gorge, I hardly recognized the city. Every hillside shingled with dark roofs, every road choked with vehicles in which disconsolate motorists sat waiting to arrive at their destinations. When we alighted at the station, it was evening, 
and the sidewalk swarmed with school children walking home under shared umbrellas, men and women in the taxi queue. The noodle shops and cafes were packed, everyone at their tables bent over notebooks, waiting for some small, bright pleasure to arrive in the form of food and drink. Every now and then, groups pressed together and smiled on cue. Girls with smooth, fair faces, eyes beguiling as butterflies with that upward sweep of eyeliner at the corners. Boys turning up two fingers to make the peace sign close to their cheeks. As someone held at arm's length a cell phone with a camera setting turned to auto selfie. As soon as the aperture shut, it opened again. And I had returned, it was true, and stood but a moment in the vestibule before my own connections came to claim me. In the days following, friend after friend exclaimed, oh, but the years haven't changed you at all. Among my kin, shyly, we broke the intervening years into pieces to dip in soup or coffee so they could soften. Both times, the buoyant and the poignant, I could hardly contain, could hardly tell apart. Until I left anew, I did not know what depth of sadness possessed me. The waters of that river never stayed still, as Heraclitus had warned long before. How they would wash my feet, but never the same way, twice. And my last offering is a more recent poem. Some of you might know that I do a daily poem writing practice, which I have um, maintained for the last 10 years and so many months, four months, I think. And this one is called Portrait of the Meter as Manananggal. To become separate, divided into parts, the way children bored after dressing and undressing their dolls will snap off a leg or an arm or the head. Foretaste of power in the split second as something gives or gives away. How when you choose instead of our chosen four, you don't have to settle. Tell, if you like, the story of how the God left you waiting at the altar of your monstrous anger and the blue-black wings it tailored for purging the countryside at night. On the ground, you leave the nether regions of that body ransacked and marked with every conquest. Where it severs from the cage of your heart, the wound is brilliant as pomegranate. Its innards go on for miles. Long before that other seed grew into a child, you knew the stories they would weave. Stingray whips, deadly poultices of salt, you and your hideous hauntings. How ordinary you look in sunlight. No one can imagine how wide the territories of ice in your sight. How you sustain those arguments with yourself through the year. Cleave or forget, soften or stay, but refuse to disappear. Thank you. Thank you, Louisa. That was so, so beautifully read, um, so vivid. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, I could comment on it now, but I'll, to continue on, I'll hold on to my thoughts, I'll put a pin in it. And um, if we can, move to um, a reading from, uh, from EJR David. Um, and um, EJR, you have the floor. Hey, um, good evening, everybody. Uh, magandang gabi. Um, my name is EJ David. And what I do is I am a, uh, I'm a professor and I'm also a researcher. And what I focus on is look at the um, mental health and just health in general, health effects of historical and contemporary forms of oppression. And that's what I do. I look at statistics every day. I teach them to my students. I talk about them all the time, um, even though I understand that they're not just numbers and they're not just statistics and that for, for me and my loved ones, these are everyday realities. 
And usually the type of writing, the type of work that I do are, you know, are, are journal articles, the ones that, that are, you know, that I submit to uh, scientific journals and, you know, I write book chapters. Um, but uh, about five years ago, one of my best friends uh, was uh, shot and killed by a police officer in his own home. And that one hit me um, extremely hard. And uh, after that, I started writing some letters uh, to my family. I wrote letters to my wife, to my sons, uh, to my daughter at that time. I have two daughters now. Um, and those letters uh, were eventually published into a book. Um, and it's the book, We Have Not Stopped Trembling Yet. Um, and really, it's a, it's a very different uh, kind of work for me as, you know, it's, it's definitely a lot more personal. Um, so I'm going to share with you all just a brief excerpt of the letter that I wrote to my sons. <clears throat> my sons, the two of you drive me nuts. You make me so frustrated because you don't pay attention. I get so exasperated because you don't listen. You don't listen the first time I ask you to do something. You don't listen when I'm trying to get your attention. You don't listen when I'm giving you instructions. You don't listen when I'm lecturing you about not listening. Sometimes I get so irritated that I even raise my voice and end up yelling at you. Because why do you always wait until I repeat myself over and over again and get to the point where I end up yelling at you before you finally pay attention, before you finally listen? But despite these occasional outbursts, I hope you don't become scared of me. I love you, Malakas. I love you, Kaluguran. I will never ever do anything to hurt you. It's just that my, emo my own emotions, insecurities, anxieties, and fears get the better of me sometimes. It's not my intention to get angry at you. Actually, I'm never angry at you. And my outbursts are never driven by any sort of animosity toward you. Instead, I need the two of you to understand that my seemingly cruel, insensitive, and strict ways are driven by my learned resentment and bitterness and even learned helplessness toward our world and by my worries about you living in this world. Malakas and Kaluguran, please pay attention. Please listen. You need to understand that you are products of both your parents' colonized histories, by your ancestors' colonized histories, and recognize how your, li how your lives in this world are going to be influenced by such colonized histories. You need to understand that although your teachers and your textbooks and your friends and your politicians and other authority figures may tell you that colonialism happened a long time ago and that it's been long over, you need to resist such lies and see how the legacies of colonialism are still around today and therefore still significantly influence your lives today. You need to know that the legacies of colonialism can still hurt you mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically and therefore potentially lead to your suffering and death. Your ancestors were victims and survivors of cultural genocide. They were dehumanized and were taught to hate themselves. Their ways were demonized and were stripped away. Your ancestors were traumatized, yet their pains, grief, and misery were minimized and never acknowledged. And many of them had to do what they had to do to survive. Many of them had no choice but to stop speaking their indigenous language and replace it with English. Some were forced to change their mannerisms to adapt Western ways of interactions. They had to replace their indigenous beliefs and worldviews with what was portrayed as more civilized and enlightened ways of knowing. Some had no choice but to keep quiet and accept the denigration, mistreatment, and injustice they were subjected to. Many of them had no choice but to leave their homelands, everything they are familiar with and love, just so they and their families can survive. They were forced to dress, act, think, and believe like the colonizers, perhaps even adopting the colonizers' prejudices as their own. And so some of them hated their own peoples, not realizing that they were also essentially hating themselves. Many of them directed their anger and frustrations toward those who they perceived as less threatening, their children, their partners, themselves. And so many of them ended up inflicting violence on their own families, on their own loved ones. Some of your ancestors were forced to encourage their children to learn the Western American ways so their children wouldn't suffer the same maltreatments and discrimination as they did. Some even taught their children to suppress the indigenous ways, to hide their heritage because of the shame and stigma that has been attached to their cultures and bodies. 
and so many eventually hated themselves and others liked them. Many of your ancestors felt helpless and hopeless. Many were forced to turn to alcohol, drugs, and other self-destructive vices to grieve for the losses, to mourn for their ancestors, to soothe their self-loathing, to numb the pains. And many were driven to end the pains permanently. My sons, historical trauma has wounded your ancestors and their wounds haven't yet healed. And you inherited, you inherited such wounds along with their violent and painful consequences for our peoples. According to research, your Filipino past and the trauma, cultural loss, and soul wounds that such ethnic and cultural oppression brought to our peoples contribute to a wide range of very gloomy outcomes today. I worry about you developing feelings of shame and self-doubt and self-hate because you're Filipino. I'm concerned about you becoming depressed, being bullied, and having low self-esteem, issues that research tells me Filipino boys like you are likely to experience. And these issues may lead to other problems like eating disorders and body dissatisfaction as research tells me that Filipino boys like you are at higher risk for these problems compared to many of your peers from other ethnic groups. As Filipino boys, research also tells me to expect you to smoke cigarettes and relatedly to worry about you dying of lung cancer. As Filipino boys, the sense of insecurity, low self-esteem, cultural loss, self-hate and identity confusions that are brought on by colonialism and contemporary oppression may also lead to other concerns for you. Research says I need to worry about you joining gangs or getting involved in criminal activities like damaging other people's properties or getting arrested as juveniles. Research also tells me that Filipino boys like you are most likely to be suspended from school, cut school, get low grades in school, experiment with or abuse alcohol and other drugs and have problematic aggressive behaviors compared to other Asian groups. Look, I know that all of these research references may seem boring to you and you may feel like they don't relate to you. So please let me make them real. Let me bring them to life. Remember how I moved to Barrow from the Philippines as a young teenager? The very first friend I made during my very first day in an American school was a mestizo Filipino boy, just like the two of you. He was cool, fashionable, popular. He showed me where my classes were, toured me around the school, and introduced me to several other kids, kids who I would end up playing on the same basketball team with. Over the years, my Filipino friends started struggling in school. I started seeing less and less of him. In fact, I don't believe he ever finished school. He got into trouble with the law several times. He got into fights and got into drugs. He got involved in gang activities and became a low level drug dealer. And just five years ago, my Filipino friend was shot dead in the streets of Anchorage. His killer, another Filipino friend of mine who I played basketball with. He was another Filipino friend who also struggled in school, also got into drugs, also became a low-level drug dealer, and also got in trouble with the law as a juvenile. My sons, that's the tale of two Filipino boys, just like the two of you. One of them is dead now, and the other is in jail for 85 years. So please pay attention. Please listen. Thank you so much for that, AJ. Um, that was very moving. I'm just gonna take a breath. Um, yes. Uh, I think um, we'll just, if, if anyone has some thoughts, please, please make note to yourself or go ahead and put that into the chat if you'd like to bring that up later or anything that, or something from Louise's share as well. Um, we will um, see what we can do to make time for everyone. And I know a lot of these topics might be stirring some further questions and some other feelings, um, which is wonderful. Um, so um, I'm excited also to um, have our next uh, panel, invited panel participant share, uh, Dwight, um, if you'd like, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, thank you very much, um, and good evening, everyone. And I actually wanted to thank everyone for coming out and everyone who made this event possible. And to EJ, I thought that was very powerful and moving read. And you know, it's a little hard to follow up. <laughs> and um, uh, my name is Dwight. Um, I'm a recent college graduate. 
So I'd like to think I'm one of the younger Filipino Americans. And for my work, uh, I do try my best to um, kind of give light to the younger Filipino Americans, um, especially now with the newer generations, uh, simply because when I first came here from Cebu, uh, I moved to Sacramento, California, more north, um, about an hour up. And growing up, I never really had a chance to um, understand the Filipino community here in the US. And which is why, as I grew older and moved down to Southern California with a very vibrant Filipino community, um, I actually got a chance to experience what Filipino culture was like and how um, my history was. But um, in regards to my work, um, I'm, I currently have uh, a book called The Voices of the New Gen Philamp Community, which I got a chance to interview random um, young Filipino American strangers from around the US and talk about how um, how their experiences was in different areas of the US and what they experience um, in the Filipino community from where they're from and what struggles that they pertain. So in this, um, I would like to read a, a quick passage from it. Um, Since American and Filipino cultures are so uniquely different, they often clash with one another, making it difficult for Phil Ams to really understand both at the same time. Each has their own individual story of culture and their experiences and thoughts help contribute and experience the current Phil Am culture here in the United States. Out of the 4 million Phil Ams here in the US, memorable figures from the Phil Am community make up a very small fraction of our stories. This creates a huge gap in truly knowing the experiences and struggles today that Phil Ams are facing, a majority of which comes from common everyday people who do not get the opportunity to share their stories. And in this book, it talks about um, all the different struggles that they have faced. And on my upcoming work, um, I'm talking about Filipino toxicity and all the different mental health aspects that come with it. And I'd like to read a really quick excerpt on it. The problem with Filipino toxicity is that it is easily passed on from generation to generation, simply because we grew up being constantly exposed to it by our parents and community. Whether intentional or unintentional, it becomes the new normal and we mistake toxic traditions for our own culture and heritage. This is why it is important to be aware of these traits in order to break free from the cycle for the next generation. And I personally encourage those who are of Filipino descent to kind of represent themselves because it is an important um, way for younger Filipinos to kind of reference and better understand their culture and from where they're from. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dwight. Thank you so much. And also for, for, for your contribution to the, the narratives that are put out there in the world to take that initiative. Um, moving along, and I'm, I'm looking at our time here. Um, uh, so we're going to have, just so people know what's coming up, Lek will share a bit about um, some of her work and then we'll just have a short conversation. If you'd like, again, to go ahead and put your, um, any questions in the chat box so that we can tend to them if we, and, um, and we'll address them later. Thank you. And Lek, over to you. Thanks, Marlo. Yeah, thank you everybody for um, joining us. I am so honored to be a part of this amazing panel. Um, my goodness, so many moving um, accounts and stories and such a talented group. Thank you so much. And thank you always, Nerissa and Joanna for um, bringing us all together. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna go through some slides real quick. Um, I'm an artist and I also write um, mostly poetry. 
And um, my artworks have involved entangling my personal history with the history of the Philippines or mixing histories where in most of these works, I'm speaking about the consequences or influences of colonialism and American imperialism on uh, Filipino Americans or the Philippines. Um, am I able to just share my screen? Let me try. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. Um, so yeah, I wanted to share a new work that I'm in the process of making. Um, but like I said before, I did that. I just wanted to quickly show some images of past works for context, um, where I am doing all of these kind of like mixing my personal history with the history of the Philippines. Um, this piece is called Towards a New Nation, uh, which mixes the experiences of my sisters and I participating in pageants in our barrio with the first time the Philippines won the Miss Universe pageant in 1969, the first time the humans landed on the moon under the um, US Apollo 11 mission and um, President Marcos's dictatorship in the Philippines. And these are uh, some of the source images that I used in making the work, the photo in the middle um, and the top right are uh, from my personal family photo album and then the rest are historical images that are all incorporated into the artwork. Um, this one is called Capre Sabario uh, and it mixes images of photos from my childhood um, with figures called Cafres that I reproduce in Velarde's map that he made in 1734 where he uh, depicted indigenous Negrito groups in the Philippines with dark skin and features similar to black Africans. And there's also an illustration of the Capre in here, which is a mythological creature in uh, Filipino folklore. And again, these are some of the reference images that I used in the work. Um, more of a mix of historical and personal images. And then um, lastly, this, the references I used for this painting, which is called uh, Expansion Before and After. Um, this includes the front page of, a, of the Boston Globe that was published in 1899 that featured racist cartoons of Filipinos showing what the paper thought the country was like before and after the US came to the Philippines. And a photo of my cousins and I pretending to be the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which is an American cartoon show that we all loved. Um, and these are some of the source images for the work. And so this is, um, this is uh, the new work that I'm working in. I haven't shown anyone <laughs> this yet. It's kind of like a, an exclusive sneak peek. So over the last few years, I've been making um, so many trips to the dentist to fix my teeth. Uh, because of like my sugar addiction. So I started thinking about the history of sugar in the country and its link to colonialism. Again, first using and looking at my personal experience as an entry point in making and uh, looking at those connections. So that eventually led me to thinking about wealth. I did by individuals, corporations or families during colonialism in the Philippines specifically from the trade and production of sugar who, you know, who profited and how that wealth, that wealth might be connected to America, um, more in the personal lives of those who directly profited, like how that history might be directly connected to some of the richest corporations in America or families today. Um, so as I'm thinking through this work right now, it's this collage of blended images. Um, and I think I'm going to work, I'm going to probably turn it into a large scale painting. And the images in here are the ones that I found from mining the internet as I'm researching the history. And um, this is generally my process, uh, my art making process. You know, I look at a bunch of images that I think might help translate what I'm trying to say conceptually and then do a kind of connect the dots, see where things link with one another. Um, 
And I like to use already produced images because these come with their own histories and they're loaded with relationships that individuals probably already have with them. So um, just in my process, I like to play with shaping and reshaping those kinds of already established relationships by bringing them into the work and reproducing, erasing, recreating them or introducing new possibilities. Um, hopefully new relationships or meaning that viewers could make out of the mixing or the entanglements of the images. Um, and aesthetically or in making the work after I've blended all the images together, I let them tell me what kinds of mutations, transformations they want to become. So it's kind of like an additive and subtracted process and it's also pretty intuitive. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to mention that the images that are in here include Coca-Cola advertisements in the 1970s in the Philippines with famous actors or American soldiers in them. Um, there's a cover photo of a Forbes magazine issue featuring America, America's richest families, historical images of Filipino sugarcane workers in Hawaii and in plantations. Um, and a photo of the Mars family, which I may or may not include, um, which is an American family that owns the confectionery company Mars, Mars Inc. that was ranked as the richest family in the US in 1988. Um, and of course, there's also a photo from my family album of my cousins and I um, in our sugarcane field, which we had in the Philippines when I was growing up there. Yeah, so that's basically um, what I have. Thank you so much, Lek, for that. Um, and, what, and, what, and what a lovely opportunity for you to offer us a sneak peek at a work in progress. That's really an honor. I know, I, I know as an artist myself, I often feel like I, I, I have a hesitancy unless it's like a studio visit, you know, to show works that are being worked through. Um, yeah, I was definitely debating, but I think I would love to have some feedback, actually. This is like a rare opportunity, especially from a community of Filipinos. Definitely, definitely. Well, here we are. We're at, um, we've received all these wonderful varied offerings. Um, and I, you know, I would just, I think that if all of us, uh, if anyone in the panel would like to speak more directly to, I. I I do have like a, a, a touching off point if you'd like, or if there's anything anyone wanted to um, discuss regarding anyone else's work or something they'd like to follow up on. Louisa? Uh, I just want, this is not so much a question as an observation. I was just very moved by everyone's uh, presentations. And I was struck by how it seems that a common theme in the works that have been gathered for this panel tonight is sort of the idea of haunting or being haunted by. And uh, I had recently been asked, I think in an interview uh, about what I think about writing, whether it is a form of being possessed or if it is a form of possessing. And I think that may be related to what we try to do in our own art forms. So uh, I'm really struck by the concordance, you know, the, the, the similar tones that we strike in terms of this idea that we are haunted, that we carry ghosts with us, that we try to negotiate these presences. We still talk to them actively, even from the present moment. And when EJ, you were talking about the violence in history that continues up to the present moment, and especially the violence inflicted on bodies of color or people of color, that too is its own particular form of haunting. And so I just wanted to thank you for bringing all of those to uh, the table tonight. Yes, very much so. I actually had written, I've written that, I was went from, if I'm looking at my, my poorly written notes, um, I don't have the best handwriting. I'm going from like ghosts and loss and mourning and um, creating presence and, you know, uh, just, just embodied presence. And I think it's, 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 I think thematically, we're quite aware of like, of, of present spirits and also that the grieving that's occurring right now in this moment in, in, in the world, really. Um, 
EJ, since um, Louisa kind of made a nod towards um, some of your offering, would you would you care to touch upon that? Yeah, no, I, first of all, uh, I think I've taken a lot more time than than, than I was <laughs> supposed to. Uh, so I just want to keep this one brief. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree with uh, Louisa's observations and yours too, um, Marlo. It's, it's a you know, it's a difficult thing, right? Uh, you know, it's it's almost like um, therapeutic as well. You know, I mean, I, I know that there's a lot of pain and a lot of, you know, haunting and, you know, perhaps even trauma, people might say, um, in, in all of our works, right? Um, you know, but at the same time, it's not just that. You know, I think there's, there's a lot of uh, healing in there too. And, you know, and I think there's a lot of hope in there too. And it, there's also a lot of uh, strength and, and resilience, um, you know, the fact that we are all still here, right? Despite all of this, despite, you know, all of these things that happened and are still happening, um, the fact that we're here and we're strong and the fact that we are still creating um, and we are still capable of loving and sharing, um, I think is a testament to our uh, strength as a people. I so much agree with that. Louisa, I think you wanted to. I think uh, Dwight had something to say and like to, you can go ahead. Okay. Oh, I was just gonna say, yeah, um, listening to you EJ definitely reminded me of, you know, how much um, I guess healing you can get from writing letters. So I just had a question like when, when you started or, or when you had decided to write letters, did you think that you were gonna make work or it was gonna become a work or was it mostly for your own kind of healing? Yeah, it was for me and it was for my family. I mean, these are real letters. Um, I wasn't sure when I was gonna give them to my kids, uh, but, but you know, the plan was, you know, I was writing for them. Um, but, but also again, it was for me as well. It was for my own healing. You know, it, it, was, it was a very dark place um, in my life at that time. Uh, like I said, you know, I started writing these letters after my best friend died. And in some twisted way, you know, many people when they're grieving, you know, they, they, they look for things, right, that can help them cope and that can help them heal. Some turn to God, you know, some turn to, uh, I don't know, some turn to alcohol, to drugs, you know, you know, but for me in some twisted way, you know, I turn to the world and not just to the world, but I turn to the to all the, the dark things that were happening in the world, like all of the other things, all the police killings that were happening, you know, and, and in some twisted way that kind of made me feel less alone and less unique. And that gave me strength. Uh, so, so yeah, um, it was, it was a lot, a lot of it was for me, but also, you know, definitely for my family, I wanted them to have it because I, to be honest with you, I, I did not know how, how much longer I was going to last um at that moment of my life um yeah it, it was it was very dark and i wanted to, to to express those things to my family before something bad happens to me <laughs> yeah thank you for that I, and i guess it's it's also like a question for for louisa and dwight i sometimes think about you know like who i'm making work for or who i'm writing for i'm just wondering if you you know, in your own process or, or when you're writing, do you think about, you know, like being able to communicate this to a certain, like to somebody, maybe somebody that you've left, you know, from home or a specific audience? Um, I guess we're always talking to something or someone when we make our art or when we write, even if we may not be immediately conscious of what we are doing in the moment that we make, what we do. Uh, I think it's also related to some, some of what EJ was just talking about in terms of how we, we uh, meet uh, the idea of grief or grieving or um, elegy basically. So uh, when we mourn, we summon things. Uh, and it's almost like, I, I kind of relate that to the ways in which um, I was taught to perceive the world and my relationship to the world growing up in an Ilocano household where we believed in the spirits, we believed that the ancestors were, you know, presences that we could talk to, we could leave food offerings for them on the table. So I guess uh, what I'm trying to say is that the manifestation of all of these things is a way of talking 
to those other things outside of ourselves. So I, I'm comforted by the idea that I'm not just doing something very solitary, very selfish for myself, even if it may seem that writing is a very solitary act. Uh, I'm always, I think, even if I may not know specifically what audience that may be, I'm always addressing someone. The energy goes outward, the feeling goes outward. I mean, you know, uh, the pain and the love, they go outward. They don't just sit with you. You have to bear them. So I think of poetry, my work with, with language and, and words as something that has to do with all of these things. Yeah, that I, I agree as well, just because... Um... Uh, as PJ said, um, everyone has different ways of coping. And that's why, as um, at the panel, um, everyone expresses their work differently. And you never know who you might end up giving hope and have them understand what you're going through. And in a way, um, it kind of helps improve everyone else that you end up touching through your work. So that's why I think it's important that you share because you never know, even just one person that you might touch will help and make their lives better, you know? Oh, very much so, very much so. I, I mean, I really like that Lech like, kind of uh, drew attention to that, that, that contributions, right? Are, like they, they're creative and they're intellectual, but they're and curative all at the same time, right? They're all holding the same space. And they function to hold us as a community as we learn to like speak, speak through it. And, and it is this thing, I was just thinking about Louisa's as she was saying about her daily practice with the writing, the poetry and how, um, you know, how many moments do we, you know, we can all create those kinds of practices, but like that is a very much a, a form that can hold us together and hold us to ourselves in a way that we don't really have spaces for, I think a lot of times with the pace of, of society and all. Um, um, yeah, wait, was that a question for me? Well, in yeah. my own writing practice, yes, I did not actually uh, initially think that it was going to be something I would be able to keep up for this length of time. But as the years uh, you know, went on, I, I just really looked forward to that space in the day when I can come to the writing uh, without any set you know, preconditions or expectations. I just know that I give that to myself. So um, instead of complaining about, I have no time, I can't go away to a residency because you know, that's privilege too, uh, but I will take what I can and I will try to imbue it with oh, whatever I can in the moment that I meet that. So I, I think I've learned a lot about myself as a writer from doing this. And the, the goal for me is not perfection. The goal is not really, you know, trying to come up with something that uh, is more beautiful than the thing that you wrote yesterday. No, not at all. But uh, it's my way also, of, you know, keeping true to these energies that sustain me, as you said, they sustain us in this way. Yeah, that, that also made me think of, um, about how about both Dwight and Lech um, kind of spoke about how uh, how their work is a way to like situate themselves in a world that that constantly it, it remind you know calls to that like like that uh, displacement and that seeking of belonging um, that a lot of um, uh, people of our heritage uh, endure right um, Dwight or elect did would you like to speak more about that? Do you, do you want to do you want to go first, Dwight? Oh, you can go first. <laughs> um. Oh yeah, that's that's you know that's always a loaded question for me. I mean, that's yeah. My way of making work is my way of understanding, basically, you know what what you're talking about, which is figuring out what is my place in the world and how is that, you know, how does that how does that look like, or how does that connect to everything else around me? Um, and uh, it's surprisingly sometimes too, it gives me purpose, which is like a great outcome of making these kinds of works. And, you know, Louisa, speaking of privilege, I, I feel like I'm very privileged too, to have come to this point where 
you know, I sort of know, uh, uh, you know, what I want to do with my work. <laughs> um, and um, also speaking of healing, it's very healing in that way. So yeah, definitely in the midst of all of these kinds of like, really complex and complicated way of trying to understand something about me and my history and everything else. I'm also getting these like gifts of, you know, like, yeah, healing and purpose and so much community building actually that's happening that I'm so grateful for. So, yeah. No, yeah. Um, I do believe that uh, whatever we do create is a form of self-representation and that's why sometimes, um, at least on my end, whenever I do make work, it's always kind of not fully done. Um, you can always continue adding on to it. And in a sense, when you share it to others, um, other people within the community also help bring it up and make it better as a whole. And like I said, uh, with luck, um, I really love the artwork. Um, it's actually one of the first times I've actually seen um, Filipino American artwork um, displayed in that sense. And to me, it is inspiring to see um, more works being put out there and have other people see and be represented um, through your works. Thank you. I, I would, I'm just going to point out that I'm, I am aware that we are two minutes past the hour. Um, and I appreciate the grace of you all to allow us to, to run a bit over. If, if I could, I would like, I would like the panel to, um, to kind of, well, we do have one very, very well you know, well language question. Um, and I think that we, it would might be nice to end it with all of us kind of addressing that question in the way we see fit. Um, again, there's so many openings here that were created that perhaps wouldn't be contained well within the hour. And there's so many levels here of the different types of work. And so I just wanted to say that like, I do wish, um, I, I, I'm grateful for all of you opening those doors and for us all being able to gather here in that way because I do think that we're just gonna be making connections for quite a while. Um, but we do have this lovely question um, from Vina Orden. How do we bridge the distances between Filipino diasporic communities divided by generations? Example, first one and a half to plus generation class and also by region. Some are embedded in Filipino communities, but others are isolated from finding that community. There seems to be more Phil Ams getting into electoral politics in the last and current local election cycle. So that say something about a larger concept of Filipino um, and then uh, all the uh, uh, X, you know, we could also put pit, pin X, Y, you know, there's uh, several different iterations of that. Um, and I feel like, although that, that question kind of has a breath, feel free to speak to any aspect of it. Um, would any of you like to have a go? Lisa? Uh, I can try. Uh, I think one of the better ways to do that, it is a huge question, is, but I think if we just kept telling our stories in just the very, the most specific ways in which we can, uh, I think this is the only way in which we can make that sense of community um, much more uh, a real, you know, a, a tangible thing. Because people are always exchanging stories. You sit down at the uh, train station and the next thing you know, you know, there might be a stranger talking to you. Uh, I, I feel especially that this is something that uh, a lot of Filipinos do. That sense of uh, community is, is very strong. Um, and so if we keep telling our stories and um, not substituting um, either the language or the facts for something we might feel is more attuned to either uh, the universal reader or whoever that is, or to a, a broader, you know, a mainstream audience. I think if we just kept true to the telling of our stories from the ground where we come from, I think that would go a long way. Yes, I would like to add on to that to where um, 
I believe just talking about it, especially to um, like the elders um, and those who are younger, just so that we kind of understand how and what they're experiencing. Because even I've fallen into that where I'm kind of scared to ask my Lolo or Lola about what they've experienced and what they went through. But if you're able to open up to those conversations and lead to them, you kind of close that gap. That way we kind of understand each other within the community. Can I do a quick follow up? I think Dwight, I'm glad that you said that, but I think sometimes just even asking the questions, even if you don't have any guarantee that these questions will be answered. And I feel that a lot, a lot of the stuff that I kind of push around in my head in my work is that kind of thing. I will probably never get a real answer to a lot of the questions that I push around in my poems, but the very act of asking them is part of the process of um, you know, bringing them out into the open, giving them an airing, and maybe that way you can have a conversation with others about things that they share in common with you. Yes, definitely. Like our EJ? Back? Oh. Yeah, I honestly don't know. <laughs> But um, I really love what I've been seeing, you know, like there's, there's so, so many voices now, so many Asian American voices that are, that are coming out um, more than ever before, I think. And I really love that. Um, and yeah, I do agree that the more stories we have, definitely the better it is, the more information really, um, you know, about our communities. Uh, I think, there's also like a lot of like stigmas, I think that we don't understand about, I mean, you know, in, on an individual level, but also like within our own community that um, could make it de very difficult to bridge those kinds of connections. And so I think part of the work would need to come from that. And I mean, I, I you know, like I'm just musing, I don't really know what that looks like, um, but, um, but yeah, I do agree that I think, yeah, the more information we have, the more stories, the more voices, the more connections um, we can make. Yeah, just real quick, I agree with everything that's been shared so far um, regarding this question. Uh, one thing that I want to add right now that I think is important for us to do as a, as a Filipino community, diaspora community, really, not just Filipino American, but the entire diaspora, is um, to, to simultaneously um, appreciate the, the importance and perhaps the need, at least politically, of the Filipino identity or Filipino American identity for us here um, in the United States. But at the same time, um, never forget and also value um, the very many um, ethnic and uh, cultural groups uh, that you know are a part of that Filipino identity, right? I think our diversity as a peoples is one of our uh, most important uh, strengths, and um, I don't think we should uh, erase that or forget about it um, in the name of you know this this pan ethnic Filipino identity, um, as important as that might be. Um, and I think we as a community have a lot of work to do in terms of really bringing up, you know, the diversity and all of the other, um, you know, worldviews and cultures and traditions, um, you know, that compose this, this Filipino umbrella term. I'm so glad you spoke to, to that, um, as that's been, you know, an ongoing discussion about this treating um, the hyphenated Philippine idea, identities as like a monolithic thing, you know, the, it's just that we're very clearly, you know, our country is like organized to be a country, right? It's a it's a grouping of islands, and 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 so when we act as if there's just the one, yeah, I'm so glad that you drew attention to that. Lek, I think you had a response. No, I was just I was just gonna totally agree, like cross community collaborations for sure. I think besides you know doing our own work within our communities, I definitely think we need institutional support just to help you know, like preserve, protect, um, and establish these foundations that we are building or these things that we are building. 
So we do have, um, Lek, thank you so much for, for, for that. And I think that's actually a nice note that it, it is an opening, right? This is not a closure, right? We are in the, we, every time we ask a question, another door opens and another door opens. And as we ask the questions together, we get answers together, right? And that, and that amount of data really shows the complexity of that difference, which is also a similarity about being Filipino is that, um, you know, the halo halo of our, of our I, I, identity. Um, I'm aware at 10 past the hour and, um, and we do have some lovely, um, we, I did, Nerese is letting me know we do have time to take one more question. And I do think that um, um, Alan, if you all can see that, um, has put a question there in the chat. Um, if anybody would like to speak to that, at what point does a person of Filipino ancestry become decolonized? And um, so I don't know if anyone would like to, to take that on. <laughs> At the moment for me, my answer is never. <laughs> um, and I feel like the moment that happens with, for me is probably the moment when I stop making work. So, yeah. Yeah, I guess I have a similar response. Um, maybe I would say it will constantly be uh, a thing to negotiate, to be in progress. We will keep wrestling with that question because I think that we are also kind of so um, embedded in all of these systemic relationships, you know, the history of the Philippines, the history of the US, uh, even if we say that, oh, you know, we've studied that in school, we are a little bit more aware than the people in the previous generation. Uh, there's always going to be, you know, some kind of blind spot which manifests in, a, you know, a kind of habit or a kind of uh, habit of mind or of action that we are not even aware of is tied to that. So it will constantly be in negotiation. But I agree with Lek, you know, this is the source of both, uh, EJ said, source of our trauma. It's also the source of great um, art and great witnessing. So I don't think you could have one without the other. Dwight or EJ? Dwight? Oh yeah, that, that was very well said by Louisa. I, I couldn't have said it any better just because um, it, it is part of kind of who we are and what we can do is just be better aware of it and make sure that um, we become better as a community. Yeah, I mean, I really don't have much to add, you know, but, you know, the, if there's one thing that, that I should add to everything that's been said is, is perhaps decolonization should also extend beyond just our personal decolonization, right? Um, you know, it, it beyond just us, you know, learning about our own history and our own, you know, place in this world, but also see how our experiences and struggles are connected to other peoples in other communities. And especially for those of us here in the United States, because we do live on, you know, on colonized lands. And there are, are indigenous peoples here in this country um, who are still fighting colonialism to this day in their own lands. And so I think for me, perhaps that's one way that we can continue our, as been said, you know, perpetual attempt uh, to decolonize um, is by uh, seeing our similarities with, with the indigenous peoples of these lands that we now call home and make sure that, uh, you know, we as one of the largest, you know, immigrant groups of this country don't just become yet another tool to erase them and to oppress them. Wow. <laughs> Everyone, thank you so much for all of those. Of you. I'm so I'm so glad that everyone found an entryway and 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 really saw the commonalities. I was I I mean as this you know as this panel progressed and as time passed, I I was I was seeing more and more so how this was such a wonderful meeting, you know, for all of us to kind of speak from our particular knowledge bases and also on on this in this moment in time, which I I'm very pleased that um, we're all recognizing that tension between the individual and the social that even for us to be as a group, we're, we're a group of singularities, right? <laughs> um, so um, I'd like to um, thank you again, panelists, for all your energy, your contributions to scholarship, contributions to the arts, um, for being you. Um, and I'd 
also like to thank um, the the center for uh, for hosting this event and for making this a possibility for us to be able to speak together at this moment. Um, and so with that, I'll turn it over to my best friend, Narisa. Thank you, Marlo. Yes. Thanks, Marlo. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so sad that we're we're short on time now that I, I wish we would actually scheduled longer so we know we know better for when we do something like this again. Um, thank you to all the panelists like Louisa, EJ and Dwight for sharing your moving works and stories and reflections and to Marlo for navigating the discussion. I want to once again thank all of our supporters for making this event possible. Special thanks to ANCC Director Joanna Picori for handling tonight's tech, Amy Bolt for managing the chat, and Francis Freeman for the transcription. I'd like to remind you to please complete the online event survey and do show your support with a donation to the Asian Arts and Culture Center. Maraming salamat. Thank you again all for joining us.